Good evening, Kate Mila Falcha, a thousand welcomes to the NHA and the Bridge of Culture Irish Rambles History Talk this evening. I'm Lucy Hecker and I have County Cork Washershore, best county in Ireland by the way, and I am thrilled to be introducing two extremely knowledgeable Irish historians this evening. But first of all, before I go into introductions, I would like to say a big thank you to the NHA to um, for collaborating with the Bridge of Culture, James Russell and his staff are, for uh, facilitating this evening, a super group to work with indeed. So um, Dr. Catherine Shannon, who I know is no stranger to the NHA, um, Dr. Catherine Shannon is a professor of history at Westfield State University. She has written on the historical roots of the Irish partition and the Northern Irish conflict. She was involved in the 1980s and the 1990s search for a peaceful settlement in Northern Ireland and has educated many on the complexities involved in the Northern Ireland, um, Northern Irish conflict. She has written on the role of women in the peace process and convened conferences for women to voice their aspirations for peace and their roles in achieving it. Dr. Shannon was the first woman president of the Charitable Irish Society of Boston and also served as the president of the ERA Society of Boston. Welcome, Dr. Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Welcome. You're welcome. And the other lovely lady is Professor Christine Keneally. Since completing her PhD at Trinity, Trinity College in Dublin, Christine Keneally has worked in educational and research institutes in Ireland, England, and more recently in the US. In September 2013, Professor Keneally was appointed the founding director of Ireland's Great Hunger Institute at Quinnipiac University in Connecticut. Professor Keneally has published extensively on modern Ireland. Her books include Charity and the Great Hunger in Ireland, The Kindness of Strangers, Frederick Douglass in Ireland, In His Own Words, and Black Abolitionist in Ireland. In 2017, she received an Emmy for her contribution to the documentary, The Great Hunger and the Irish Diaspora. So welcome, um, Professor Keneally. So wonderful having you both here tonight. So thank you so much for inviting Catherine and I to be part of St. Patrick's Month. Uh, I know both Catherine and I have spoken in Nantucket and been hosted by the NHA. And even if it's virtual, we're delighted to be back and to be hosted by the NHA tonight. Um, I wish we were actually on the island and with our friends there, but hopefully next year. So Catherine and I, as you heard, were historians or Irish historians. We've worked on a number of projects together and one of our big common interests is the great hunger, the Irish famine. And we've come to it from different perspectives. Um, and so tonight we thought it'd be interesting to actually join our knowledge and create something slightly different, slightly new. And we're going to look at relief from New England during Ireland's famines. So even though our focus will be on the great hunger of 1845 to 42, we're going to broaden it out. So it is a joint presentation. It's totally brand new and you know, we're doing it at a distance from each other. So we hope it works, but we'll start. I'm going to start and then hand over to Catherine and then we're going to sort of you know, play it by ear. So I just want to start by placing what happens in Ireland in context. You all know Ireland was a colony of England, Britain since the 12th century. And throughout those centuries, Irish people were increasingly marginalized, dispossessed um, and stereotyped in many negative ways. But one thing that uh, is a common recurrence within those centuries of colonization is the recurrence of food shortages and of famines. And really, if you look at it and I should mention that we brought out a book and of course the great Catherine is in it last year, looking at famines before and after the great hunger. And what conclusion we came to, we worked with 20 other historians, is that pretty well every generation in Ireland up to the 20th century faced famine, up to the 21st century even. And what this famine shows us is that Irish people, in fact, were incredibly resilient in finding ways to survive. And obviously, emigration in the later period became one of those ways to find survival. And just very briefly, 17th, 18th century, there were famines. Um, some were politically caused, some were 
caused by nature. 1650s, Cromwell's confis confiscations. You may have heard of Oliver Cromwell, especially if you have roots in Drogheda or Wexford. And he was pretty brutal in his scorched earth policy. And then he took land from the native Irish to give it to his soldiers. But as a result of what he did in Ireland, the population fell by half. 1717 to 18, there was a drought in Ulster and 1725 to 29, poverty, wretchedness, misery and want, a quote, in many parts of Ireland. And some of you may recognise that image. It's from Jonathan Swift's wonderful satire, A Modest Proposal. And he was a Protestant, a Protestant minister, but he was very perturbed by the way in which England was governing Ireland. And he wrote this satire in which he advocated that people should, if they were hungry, eat babies. Of course, he did not mean it, but it was a way of showcasing the poverty and misgovernment of Ireland in 18th century Ireland. Emigration in the 18th century became a safety valve and interestingly most of that emigration came from people in Ulster, from Protestants and many of them settled in what was colonial America. In the middle of the 18th century there was a massive famine which some historians feel the mortality equaled that of the famine of a hundred years later. What we do know about this famine is it was caused by a mini ice age so weather was to account for it. But Ireland recovered in its wake. 1754 to 55 drought in Ulster again another wave of emigration to colonial America. So the century ends with a rebellion in 1798 and this led to the abolishment of the Irish Parliament in Dublin and the creation of the United Kingdom. And so after 1800, Ireland is governed from London. Ireland does not have its own Parliament. So again, this is a period in the early 19th century of recurring food shortages. And during these food shortages, Ireland is governed from London. And so you can see that frequency is quite astounding, 1816 to 17, 1821 to 23, 1831 to 33, 1835, 1842, and then of course the one we all know of, the Great Hunger, so known because of its longevity of 1845 to 1852. And of course, each wave of food shortages creates a new wave of emigration. So even before we get to 1845 to the Great Hunger, Ireland has one of the highest levels of emigration of any country in Europe. But emigration at this stage is a very rational decision. It's done in a calm, organised fashion. And it's mostly either young single men or some family units. And it tends to be people who are ambitious, who leave Ireland. And then we get to 1845. At this stage, about 40% of the population were dependent on a diet of potatoes, really nothing but potatoes. So when this new type of disease comes to Ireland in 1845, the consequences are very serious. But as I said, people in Ireland were used to dealing with food shortages and were resilient. And in 1845, there was a belief that 1846, there would be no blight and the potato crop would be good. So at this stage, people feel they're only dealing with one year of shortages, although severe shortages. And what's interesting is some places decided that they would help Ireland when they heard about the potato blight. And this is an era of mass communication, not as we know it today, but in terms of railways opening up, steamships, postage, etc. And two places to send money to Ireland were interestingly Calcutta in India, very first place to send relief to Ireland during the Great Hunger, and Boston in the United States. And they did so for very different reasons. Calcutta which was part of the British Empire. The committee there was founded by a brother of the Prime Minister, Sir Robert Peel, and they sent money to express their support for the British Empire and to show Irish people what it meant to be part of this great empire. The money from Boston was motivated by very different reasons. It was motivated by people who wanted Irish independence and they sent money to show the inadequacy of British rule 
in Ireland. And we have no photographs of the famine. Photography was in its infancy. And one of the first images of famine in the world actually takes place in India. This is a photograph. And if you can imagine, this could be your ancestors, but just in a different context. So, as I said, the first amount of money that comes from America is from the Boston Repealers, people who supported Daniel O'Connell in his quest to end the Act of Union. And the president was John James, and I'm sure Catherine knows a lot about John James. And he, when he was presenting, um, asking people to raise money, he said, due to the fatal connection of England with Ireland, the rich grain harvests of the former country are carried off to pay an absentee government and an absentee propriety. And there is a lot of truth in what he said, because throughout the seven years of great hunger, massive amounts of food continued to leave Ireland. And initially, $750 was collected, some in very small quantities, but then the, um, the amount grew and grew. So other places in Boston send money to Ireland. $264 was contributed by St. Nicholas Parish in East Boston. And this church had only opened in 1844 and it had been established by Irish immigrants. And a successful local contractor, Daniel Crowley, raised over a thousand dollars from his employees and associates. So you can see at the end of 1845, a lot of money was coming to aid Ireland. And then, and again, I know Catherine, I might add her to if she wants to say something, but by December, Boston's Irish had sent $19,000, an incredible amount of money multiplied by 50 to get an equivalency today. And most of this relief was raised by an Irish born priest um, who was also a doctor, Father Thomas O'Flaherty of Salem. And Catherine, do you want to say anything about Father O'Flaherty? Uh, yes, he was a very, very energetic priest in Boston, and, and not only uh, a, a medical doctor, but also well-trained in theology, and ha had, had a very, very large following of parishioners, first when he was in Boston and later in Salem. But he knew immediately what the implications of the loss of the potato crop would be, and was particularly concerned about women and children uh, being very, very vulnerable uh, and uh, really was a driving force behind uh, the relief raising efforts in that year, along with his, uh, one of his fellow priests, Father Riley. Um, and his, his death in, in March of 1846 was a real tragedy because uh, he had been the leader of the community in this effort. And just um, as we say here, most of that money really was concentrated at the end of 1845. Uh, less money came in 1846, partly because reports were now coming through the newspapers that in fact the extent of disease wasn't as much as had first been feared. And then the death of somebody, you know, this incredible fundraiser, Father Thomas O'Flaherty. So there was some fundraising activities in 1845, but very, very limited to America and India. So, as I said, people really felt that the blight was just a one year occurrence and that good crops would return in 1846. Unfortunately, this was not the case. The blight came back even more virulently in 1846 to a smaller degree, 1847, complete failure in 1848, partial failure in 1849, 1850 and 1851. So, as I said, seven years of famine. And even though Ireland was part of the United Kingdom, part of the British Empire and was governed by London, which was the richest empire in the world at the time, the government really did not come to the aid of the people. And so by the end of 1846, people are starting to die. And because of newspapers, this is being reported throughout the world. And again, at the end of 1846, we see the start of a wave of emigration, but not orderly emigration as we'd seen before 1845. These are people who are desperate to leave the country, whatever time of year and by whatever means possible. And of course, this gives rise to the phrase coffin ships. And just to give you some sense of the awfulness 
of what was happening in Ireland and how quickly. This is a report from December 1846 of Skibbereen. And Skibbereen, um, we've heard that Cork is the best county in Ireland, but you Skibbereen in County Cork really suffered dreadfully, 1846, 1847. And this is a report by a government official. And he says, upon arriving at Skibbereen, I saw three dead bodies lying in the street, which I buried with the help of the constabulary. Deaths are occurring daily in this place. 197 persons have died in the workhouse here since November the 5th. And in that same period, nearly 100 bodies have been found dead in lanes or in derelict cabins, half eaten by rats. And again, this is something that's a very common trope during the famine. People are so weak that they are eaten by animals, by pigs, by rats, by dogs. And you might be familiar with this image. Um, things were so bad that the London Illustrated News sent an Irish-born artist to Skibbereen. And as he was traveling, at one point his coach stopped and this woman approached him. And he said she had in her arms this beautiful child. And his assumption was she was asking for money to feed her son. In fact, the baby was dead and she was asking for money to bury her son. So this is a real person um, depicted here and um, very tragically. There's some belief, um, which hopefully is now being um, counteracted, that people in the northeast of Ireland, which is predominantly Protestant, didn't die during the famine. And that's not true. This was a truly national disaster. And relief, I'm sorry, distress in Belfast was intense. If any of you know Belfast, Shankill is a Protestant area, both then and now. And the Belfast burial ground was overflowing in 1847. And this again is a report from a medical officer in Shankill in Belfast. Those most destitute are confined to their homes unseen, unpitied and unrelieved, unable to apply to soup kitchens or to go begging from hunger, cold, weakness, sickness, and even from want of proper covering. The suffering is very much greater and more extended than what is generally conceived. And again, something that um, comes to the fore again and again is the British government in London, the press in London was playing down the impact of what was going on in Ireland. The people who we would call them now frontline workers were saying, no, nothing is exaggerated. It is worse than you can imagine. And this is a man you may have heard of. In fact, um, we opened up with the Fields of Athen Rye song and a famous line in it is that Michael has gone to jail because he stole Trevelyan's corn so his young might see the morn. And Charles Trevelyan was a British civil servant and highly influential in looking after relief provision from the British government. And this is just one quote from him, which gives you an insight into his attitude to giving relief. The judgment of God sent the calamity to teach the Irish a lesson. That calamity must not be too much mitigated. The real evil with which we have to contend is not the physical evil of the famine, but the moral evil of the selfish, perverse and turbulent character of the people. And Charles Trevelyan was in charge of famine relief from 1845 to 1852. And absolutely the wrong person to be in charge of this humanitarian effort. So, as I said, the potato failed a second time in 1846. This time, almost 100% of the crop was destroyed. And people who had had resources the previous year, they might have slaughtered their pig, they might have pawned their claddering, sold their fishing tackle. Now they were totally without resources. But what's really interesting is that as government relief so palpably proved to be inefficient and inadequate for the needs of the people, a philanthropic movement gathered momentum throughout the world. And that's what we want to talk about. I'm going to talk about it generally, and then I'm going to hand over to Catherine to talk about it more locally. So you may have heard of the Society of Friends and they're much lauded for their work during the famine. And they were some of the first people to get involved. And they were very well known for their progressive attitudes. They were abolitionists. These were the people who just a year earlier had welcomed Frederick Douglass to Ireland. And in November 1846, Quakers in Dublin established the Central Relief Committee of the Society of Friends. 
and it had auxiliary committees in London and New York and a number of women's committees were formed and the women's committees mostly devoted themselves to raising blankets and clothing for the people realizing that's what people also needed as well as food. The key thing that the Quakers did was they set up soup kitchens throughout Ireland and most of the soup was made available freely and when they went to an area they'd give money for the soup kitchens to be set up and they worked very closely with a lot of ladies committees so women were very important in this whole relief process. Um, so while this is happening in Ireland news is reaching America about people dying in Ireland and in February 1847 the vice president of America has a meeting in Washington in which he invites delegates from all over America to attend and my challenge to you is does anybody know who the vice president of America was in 1847 he was pretty controversial and people come from all over to this meeting and it's decided that the ports of Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, New Orleans will be the main ports for sending supplies to Ireland. So Boston is chosen um, to be a for a strategic role during the famine. Unfortunately, at this stage, the canals are frozen in the north. So some of the early relief comes through New York. At this meeting also, it was resolved that the mayor of Boston, who at the stage was Josiah Quincy, the Honourable Marcus Morton, who is the collector of the Port of Boston, and the Honourable Abbott Lawrence be requested to act as a general committee for Boston and New England generally to receive and forward contributions for Ireland. So this is February 1847. So Boston's involvement is very organised and comes very early. And just to you know, give you a sense of the donors who get involved in giving relief to Ireland in 1847, because it truly is a remarkable and unique humanitarian effort. So some of the people who send money to Ireland, and they're very eclectic, Tom Thumb, um, who was traveling in England at the time, Abraham Lincoln, I'm sure you've heard of him, Queen Victoria, even though she's the famine queen, she did send money to Ireland. Sultan of Turkey, only 24 years old, sent money to Ireland. The Pope, of course, he sent money to Ireland. Frederick Douglass, who was traveling in Britain at the time, sent money to Ireland. And then one of the most moving donations comes from the Choctaw Nation, people who themselves had been dispossessed, marginalized, and treated so brutally during the Trail of Tears. So you just get a sense of people from all walks of life, many of whom have no real connection with Ireland, who are sending money to help the starving poor in Ireland. And just before I hand over to Catherine, some of the donations were controversial. And as I told you, the Quakers were involved who were abolitionists. And one of their allies in America was William Lloyd Garrison, the editor of The Liberator. And in April 1847, he made an appeal in his newspaper, The Liberator, for money to be sent to Ireland. But he also said, Ireland is in the most deplorable state. It is awful to contemplate. But as to the slave holding portion of your people, even to save life, we cannot touch that money stained with the slave's blood. It is every moment crying to God for vengeance. Send back that money. So that's just to give you an idea of some of the complexities involved in raising money and um, distributing money. But at this point, I want to hand over to Catherine because Catherine is going to focus on the role of New England in saving Ireland from famine. Uh, thank you, Christine, uh, very much. And uh, you provided a very good introduction to what happened in Boston uh, in 1845 in relation uh, to the efforts of Father Flaherty, of Flaherty and uh, his success in uh, raising uh, $19,000 to send by the end of that year. Uh, in, in addition to J uh, the head of the repeal movement, in Boston, another disincentive for an organized relief effort that year was a result of Thomas Darcy McGee's intervention, who wrote from Dublin uh, without authorization from the repeal organization that uh, the repeal association in Boston should focus on the political objective rather than fundraising. So that seems to have been an, uh, a factor in 
uh, causing organized efforts to decline in that year. However, as uh, you mentioned, when we got into 1846, uh, clearly by the summertime, news came that conditions were not improving and that they were, were facing another crop failure. Initially in Boston, these were scattered reports in, in, the, in the course of the fall of 1846. But finally, in uh, January of 1847, uh, the arrival of the RMS Hibernia on the uh, uh, 20th of January confirmed the reports of a total collapse of the 1846 crop and that the country was facing widespread starvation and mounting mortality and that swift action uh, was necessary. And within two weeks, uh, $72,000 was raised locally that was sent back on the Hibernia's uh, return journey. The uh, images and the uh, commentary in the London Illustrated News, uh, which would come within uh, the last weeks of January and early February, were also important in broadcasting the fact that there was a real crisis in Ireland and no longer could uh, the British government deny this or the uh, Anglophiles in Boston play down the existence of uh, a, a serious crisis in Ireland. Now, two people who were very influential in calling for direct action were Daniel Webster and John Greenle Greenleaf Whittier. Uh, they gave great support to President George Dallas's recommendation for a nationwide campaign in the cities that you mentioned to set up relief organizations. Uh, and, and that uh, certainly Whittier said in New England that all faiths had to become involved in the relief efforts, uh, not just Catholics, not just Irish, but everyone. Uh, one response that came very quickly was the response of the Charitable Irish Society, uh, an organization founded by Ulster immigrants in that 18th century immigration. What they did was to cancel their annual dinner on March 17th and contributed its expected proceeds to famine relief. This was the only time they canceled their uh, annual dinner since the, since the American Revolution. And at least 32 of their members served on the ward committees that were established uh, in a fund that the local bishop, Bishop Fitzpatrick, set up. And some also worked in uh, what would become the New England Relief Committee campaign as collectors. Now, B Bishop Fitzpatrick was a son of Irish immigrants. And he launched a diocesan-wide appeal on February 7th speaking in the old Holy Cross Cathedral. He gave a very powerful and emotive sermon that left many in tears and uh, made them very, very anxious to contribute to the cause. His quotation of John chapter three, verse 17, had a wide appeal, not just to Catholics, but also to the Protestant elite community with whom he had very cordial relations. And that verse was, quote, he who has the goods of this world and sees his brother in need and closes his heart to him, how does the love of God abide in him? Fitzpatrick got the assistance of the two richest Irish men in Boston for his uh, appeal campaign. They were Andrew Carney and Patrick Donahue. Uh, who, uh, because of their business acumen and their influence, were able to be very successful in getting uh, uh, funds contributed to the Bishop's Fund. Connie was a very generous philanthropist and later was the, the uh, founding uh, benefactor for Connie Hospital. And he also gave a great deal of money uh, to fund uh, Boston College. Donahue was the editor of the Boston Pilot, uh, 
and had other important business interests. So uh, they were influential in the city and respected by, widely throughout the city. Now, as you mentioned, uh, Mayor Josiah Quincy hosted the 18th February meeting at historic Faneuil Hall that established the New England Committee for the Relief of Ireland and Scotland. The meeting was in response to the calls for action from Vice President Dallas, from Webster and Whittier, as well as the, the powerful example of over 4,000 people packed the building, not just Irish, but the city's most influential bankers, merchants, and businessmen. Harvard president and renowned orator Edward Everett gave the clarion call, emphasizing Christian duty of all uh, to join in the effort to send relief to Ireland. Five leading Brahmins, Abbott Lawrence, Patrick Tracy Jackson, Thomas Lee, and Samuel Howe, who had run the Greek relief effort two decades earlier, each contributed $2,000 immediately uh, at that meeting, and others would give lesser amounts. Now, the uh, Forbes brothers, uh, Captain Robert Bennett Forbes and his brother John were among the prominent citizens in attendance at Faneuil Hall on that February evening. And they were extremely moved by Edward's, uh, Edward's address and the graphic reports of uh, Irish suffering. And they joined the New England Relief Committee immediately. Within two days, it was John who came up with the idea of using the USS Jamestown, uh, a naval ship then lying idle at Charleston's Navy Yard to transport New England food donations directly to Ireland. They used their Washington contacts with, with Webster uh, and others, and by March 3rd, were able to secure government permission for the vessel to be turned over to the New England Committee. For Congress, this was a good solution to the fact that Congress, uh, uh, sympathetic uh, people in Congress to the Irish were uh, unable to secure $300,000 in taxpayer money for Irish relief. So authorizing the use of the Jamestown to this civilian committee was a way for them to provide some relief and uh, help Ireland in its hour of need. Now, Captain Forbes uh, volunteered his services as captain of the ship, and this was highly appropriate because he had a stellar career as a successful sea captain and a businessman. Uh, and he was also president of the Boston Marine Society, which enabled him to pick other qualified ship officers who also agreed to forego any payment for their services. Forbes took command of the Jamestown on 11 March and quickly readied the ship and recruited officers and 31 crew members whose wages came from separate contributions from Boston churches and the sailors' local uh, communities. The cost of uh, the transport and storage of the food arriving from New England farms and villages and towns was waived by the rail owners and the wharf owners. Loading was begun on March 17th and completed on the 27th with a total cargo of 800 tons of provisions. The ship departed Boston with a gala send off, tugged out of Boston by the steamer uh, named after Captain Forbes as shown in, in, in the picture on the screen. The voyage was a difficult one initially with rough seas and cold wet weather, but the ship had a record crossing reaching Cork Harbor in just 15 days and three hours on the 12th of April, 1847. There was a jubilant welcome from the people of Queenstown and Cork whose hopes of American help were finally being realized. A lavish banquet was organized by local leaders two days later and the bill of fare and generous encomiums given to Forbes 
clearly embarrassed him. And he uh, told uh, uh, his uh, hosts that the real credit should go to all the people in Boston who had sacrificed to send food and, and provisions uh, uh, to Ireland. Now, Forbes had two local helpers uh, in his work in Cork. One was William Rathbone, a Liverpool philanthropist, who came over to Cork on the 17th of April to help in devising a distribution plan for the food that the Jamestown had brought. Forbes also contacted Father Theobald Matthew, who was doing his best to help the people uh, of Cork. Uh, Father Matthew took Forbes on a tour of Cork City, and Forbes uh, later recorded uh, his memories of that visit. He described the city of Cork as a valley of death and pestilence. I saw enough in five minutes to horrify me. Hovels crowded with the sick and dying. Some call for water to Father Matthew and others for a dying blessing. On April 17th, Forbes and a local poor law official met with city officials and some country gentry to devise a distribution plan. It took a week of discussion to finalize the plan, but the map on the screen shows uh, that the relief supplies were distributed throughout the, count the county. Uh, could you have that slide, uh, Christine? Yeah. Uh, 20 tons went to Cork City and the circled areas show the, the centers that got the same amount so that they could pass on five tons to 160 localities spread throughout the region. It's hard to determine exactly how many people received relief as records are not extant. One person who may have received some relief was a five-year-old boy who was a sub whose family was subtenants of Lord Bandon, and he was my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, David Shannon, who later came to America. The total amount raised by the New England Committee was $151,000, more than twice the initial goal. The Jamestown transported $34,000 of provisions and five other privately owned Boston ships and the USS Macedonian carried the remainder. As Christine has mentioned, Quaker relief from America was very important in 1847 and provided a large portion of the funding for the Quaker-run soup kitchens, which the British government eventually copied, uh, if belatedly, uh, in May and June in 1847, after the closure of the public works. Jacob Harvey, a New York Quaker, was a driving force behind this U.S. effort. Nantucket, as well as Salem, Massachusetts Quakers, were especially generous in their response, Nantucket giving $2,000 in 1847, despite having suffered a devastating fire nine months earlier. So it's over to you now, Christine. Okay. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Um, and my computer wants to stay. Okay, so um, if I can just sum up some of um, what happened, 1847, at the harvest, there was blight, but it was on a smaller degree than earlier years. And the British government took the opportunity to say that the famine was over. And that in future, they would not give any assistance and that all relief was to come from Irish taxpayers. So even though, as we've discussed, Ireland was part of the United Kingdom of the British Empire, in Ireland's greatest hour of need, Ireland was left to its own resources. And it's very clear the famine was not over. In 1848, one and a half million people in Ireland, a population then of seven million, were dependent on the poor law for some basic form of relief. So the famine was not over in 1847. Sadly, although it was not the end of famine, it was pretty well the end of charity. By the end of 1847, most charitable donations had dried up. 
for a number of reasons. One, there was a belief, because the British government had said it was so, that the famine was over. Um, there was rumours that the money is being misappropriated, especially as there was a rise in repeal activity, the growth of Young Ireland, who actually led a rising in 1848. There was what we would now call donor fatigue. People might give once or twice, but then they become tired of giving and suspicious of giving. And then, as we know, mass emigration meant that many of the very poorest or not so very poorest were arriving in the ports of Liverpool, of Boston, of Montreal, etc. And people saying, why are we sending money to Ireland when they're coming here and they're a burden on our taxation and they're bringing disease? So for a number of reasons, this great charitable endeavour largely came to an end at the end of 1847. Uh, unfortunately, the famine, as I said, continued for a few more years. So we talk about the Great Famine of you know, ending 1852. To some extent it did, but the legacy continued. But Ireland in the late 19th century underwent, again, numerous periods of food shortages. Again, it's shocking when you actually put them down. Um, 1861, 63, 1867, 69, 1876. The big one, which Catherine will come to later, 1879 to 1882, 1885 to 86, 1888, 1890 to 91, 1895 to 96, 1897 to 98. And then even after Ireland acquired semi-independence, there was um, massive hunger, poverty and starvation in 1925. So again, as we said at the very beginning, you know, this is a country who generation to generation underwent food shortages. And just to, to focus on two of these forgotten famines, because they are to a large extent forgotten famines. And 1860 to 62, even as Ireland was recovering from the great hunger, Ireland undergoes another period of sustained shortages, especially in the west of Ireland. And people in the west continued to depend on potatoes. They had no choice. And bad weather over a number of seasons ruined the potato crop and also peat and peat was very important in terms of keeping people's little homes warm. And as with every period of food shortages, it resulted in intense period of evictions, adding homelessness to the problem of hunger and also emigration. So if your ancestors came you know, throughout the 19th century, they may not have come because of the great hunger, but they may have come because of some of these period of what we call forgotten famines. So assistance did come to Ireland 1860 to 62. Um, it's actually hard to find examples of it. Catherine and I were discussing that. But one of the main bodies in existence in the 1862 famine, and they also were in existence during the Great Hunger and during the famine of 1822, was the Mansion House Committee. And if any of you know Dublin, you'll know the Mansion House is the home of the Lord Mayor of Dublin. It is still there to this day. And they were very known for their philanthropic activities. So most of the money during this mini famine came through the Mansion House Committee in Dublin. And donations from Boston, they were again, you know, very diverse. Uh, Boston Catholic churches collected 970 pounds. And this is by the Reverend Dr. Fitzpatrick. Catherine, do you know him? Oh yes, I'll be mentioning uh, him. Yeah. Okay, so we'll leave him for later. I I knew you'd know him. George Upton, I can mention him we, in a minute. Um, he was a merchant. He gave £100. The Montgomery Union Association, they gave £149. The Boston Pilot, which Catherine's already talked about, um, Patrick Donahoe. And they were a great um, funnel for money coming to Ireland for all sorts of reasons. Um, one donation was £98. There were multiple. And then the Irish Reading Room in Salem. And Salem I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, Salem, um, seems to be Salem. a great Salem, thank you, for um, fundraising of all sorts of activities. If I can just mention one of these men, because there is a connection, George Bruce Upton, who's an American shipbuilder, politician, he served in the Massachusetts House of Representatives, you might know him, but why I'm mentioning him is he has a Nantucket connection. He married Anne Coffin Hussey, of Nantucket in May 1828, and they had eight children. So I just thought I'd throw in Nantucket came to the relief of Ireland, 1860 to 1862.
And now Catherine's going to talk about what we call the Forgotten Famine of 1879 to 1882. Thank you, Christine. Uh, here on uh, the screen, you see uh, an illustration from the Freeman's Journal in early 1880 that shows a desolate Mother Island showing the, holding the census summary documenting the steady loss of the country's population since the Great Famine. Uh, in the background, we can see the immigrant ship that took the young and ambitious, leaving their parents to die without ever seeing their offspring. Notice well the cottage in the background being destroyed, a typical event after evictions. And indeed, there was a sharp rise in evictions in uh, the, the, the year 1879 through, yes, 1879 through to 1880. Uh, now, in the next slide, uh, oh, I think, it, did you skip one there, Christine? Sorry, no. No, I'm sorry. Oh, 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 okay. Well, you can go back, go back one. In any case, uh, it, it, the west of Ireland in 1879 faced a tsunami of problems and difficulties. First of all, bad weather for the previous three years, uh, a three quarter drop in the value and the amount of potatoes harvested between 1876 and 1879 plus a huge credit crisis, uh, which meant that shopkeepers could not extend credit for people to buy food in the local shops. Uh, in addition to that, many landlords were suffering from the economic decline in the English uh, uh, financial markets, and therefore were unable to extend any kind of relief or rent uh, abatements to their tenants. Some of them wouldn't have done it anyway. Uh, and thus, there were many, many evictions that took place. Uh, the five major landowners in County, in County Mayo were absentee landlords. And this meant that th th there wasn't a attention paid to the growing misery of uh, their tenants because uh, they didn't see what was happening firsthand. Uh, and as Christine mentioned, uh, in the west of Ireland, the majority of people were still dependent upon the potato. They were uh, people who were using the same kind of agricultural methods that uh, basically had been used in famine times. And this meant that uh, food production was not as efficient as it was uh, or, or, or varied as it was in the uh, provinces of Munster and Leinster. Another factor was the decline in seasonal harvest work in England in the 1870s. This was a serious issue for those tenants who depended upon the, those wages as migrant laborers to pay their annual rents. Many by 1879 owed two years rents, two years of rents. Uh, it was in these circumstances uh, that the land agitation uh, was triggered initially by Michael Davitt and later taken over by Charles Stuart Parnell. Uh, this, this cartoon here from the magazine Pat shows a tenant farmer who is being badly affected by the increasing competition that Irish farmers face from American agricultural exports being sent to Ireland. The completion of railway links in the United States meant that Midwestern uh, grain could be sent to the Eastern ports cheaply and quickly, and then shipped overseas to England, uh, Ireland, and Europe. And this put a very heavy competition uh, to uh, the Irish farmers. And here we see Pat being very perplexed by uh, the tin goods and other products that were coming from America. Actually, I think Pat looks rather well fed in this cartoon. <laughs> he doesn't look as if he's starving. But anyway, uh, news of the distress of the West of Ireland uh, in 1879 reached Boston quickly as a result of the fact that the telegraph system that was installed in 1866 uh, could bring news from Ireland within 24 to 36 hours of events happening 
or of newspaper reports being filed. Uh, and throughout the, the, the summer of 1879, priests in the west of Ireland were very, very active in sending reports of the devastation that their uh, communities were facing and that they were really facing uh, the possibility of a repeat of the starvation and the mortality that Ireland had suffered 30 years before that. Michael Davitt, who uh, had, had uh, been jailed for many years for his Fenian activities, had come to Boston in 1878 and established a friendship with John Bowl O'Reilly, who was now the editor of the Boston Globe. And Davitt more or less served as a correspondent for the Globe and kept O'Reilly very informed about the deteriorating conditions uh, in the country and also to uh, formulate land leagues that could fight evictions and win better tenant protections for the tenant farmers in Ireland. Now, Boston was a, it, now in a position to respond very uh, effectively to uh, the crisis that uh, was emerging in Ireland in 1879. There were now 370,000 Irish born and, uh, in, in the New England area. And they and their children obviously had bitter, bitter and haunting memories of the 1840s and were determined to render assistance. O'Reilly, as well as Patrick Collins, who had immigrated from Ireland as a small boy, organized a large meeting on the 6th of October at historic Faneuil Hall, the same site that saw the birth of the Jamestown effort. Collins gave a very fiery speech promising unrelenting American aid and effort to help suffering Ireland. O'Reilly, Collins, and Donahoe were the ringleaders in organizing Parnell's visit to Boston in January. O'Reilly and Asa Potter served as collectors and, and, and treasurer for a Parnell relief fund. And between January and March, they sent $61,300 in relief aid to Ireland, or one fifth of the $300,000 total that Parnell raised in his 62 city tour. Again, the Charitable Irish Society canceled its St. Patrick's Day dinner and gave $1,000 to the Irish relief effort. And many of its members also became active in the American Land League uh, activities. Now, at the same time, Archbishop John Williams followed the precedent of 1847, the precedent of Bishop Fitzpatrick, and he launched a diocesan-wide appeal that netted $37,000 that was sent to Cardinal McGettigan in Amar for distribution to the needy, irrespective of religion. Not only did he do that, but in January 1881, at the urging of Collins and O'Reilly, he issued a, uh, a pastoral in which he justified by religion and morality the cause of the Land League calling it a just and righteous cause. Now, as in 1847, there were proposals in Congress to send American money for Irish relief. At one stage, $300,000 was recommended, but this proposal died owing to opposition from uh, some uh, congressmen uh, and President uh, Hayes who cited uh, constitutional grounds uh, that American taxpayer money could not be spent on overseas activities. Instead, Congress did approve the use of the USS Constellation, uh, then at the Brookline Navy Yard for shipment of food donated by private citizens and organizations. Three New York businessmen, Levy Morton, William Grace and the New York Herald owner, James Gordon Bennett, contributed three quarters of the cost of 
for food and the remainder came from others, including the proceeds of a Boston concert run by Brahmins that raised $2,300. The total amount raised by Gordon's New York Fund was $341,000. James Redpath, who covered the famine in Ireland and had his articles run in the Boston Pilot as well as in the uh, Boston Globe and New York papers, estimated that the total US contribution during this forgotten famine amounted to $5 million. Boston servant girls, as always, responded to the needs of their families in Ireland very generously, obviously saving many lives in doing so. And here we have a picture of servant girls lining up at one of the uh, shipping bureaus ready to send their hard-earned wages back home. Donahue's bureau sent 2,250 drafts worth 5,376 pounds, or about $25,000, uh, in December of 1879. And another 36,000 in private donations was sent in January and February from uh, women as well as from, from some men. Parnell's sister, Fanny, who lived in America, played an important role in the mobilization of Irish America to send relief, as well as to get funds for the Land League's effort to fight eviction. Her famous poem, Hold the Harvest, which was first published in O'Reilly's Pilot, became the Marseillaise of the Land League. She also worked with Michael Davitt in New York in raising relief money and then formed in October of uh, 1880, the Ladies Land League of America. In uh, the next year, uh, she made many appeals uh, uh, through the press, but also came to Boston in May of 1881 and uh, made 10 appearances in uh, Boston and surrounding cities urging people to contribute to the Land League relief as well as funds needed for the Land League's legal expenses. The cartoon uh, in, in this next slide captures the widespread American critique of the British government's refusal to provide significant assistance when Ireland was part of the United Kingdom and uh, was suffering greatly. As you can see, you can't see the caption, but uh, Britannia is saying to Disraeli, uh, and, and that of course would be Queen Victoria, uh, it's Britannia, saying to Disraeli, who was the prime minister and had been very indifferent to Ireland's needs, not just in this circumstances, but on many other issues during his time as prime minister. She said, quote, it is rather too bad that we have to receive another lesson in humanity from America, unquote. Uh, the Boston Globe was equally uh, critical of the uh, British government's failure to act promptly in 1879. And in December of that year, it, in an editorial, it said, that if England did not act, she would lose in the estimation of the world her claim to sovereignty over Ireland. Thus, in both 1847 and again between 1879 and 1881, the people of New England responded generously to the humanitarian obligation to help Ireland when its people were in crisis. The first effort was truly an ecumenical one, while the latter effort was less so, being managed and directed by a group of Boston Irishmen who were now well equipped to lead the effort to mobilize uh, 370,000 Irish born and their children in New England to help their native land in their hour of need. Thank you. So uh, we're going to end here and just to end by saying famines were a feature of life in Ireland for many, many centuries. 
and especially in the 19th century it, the mortality was horrific especially during the great hunger but without these interventions by such generous people you know we know many more people would have died so thank you for listening thanks catherine thanks sir uh, christine that was absolutely terrific it, i learned something new every time i listen to you both give presentations and, and, and this uh, tag team that you've uh, conjured up tonight has been absolutely fantastic so thanks from situates and uh, from connecticut uh, we'll go about another 10 minutes, if you don't mind. We've got a number of questions to ask you. Uh, but I think I should start by uh, 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 pointing out that, you know, we usually give our speakers, uh, uh, or offer our speakers honorarium, and uh, we did to you too. And it be donated to the Navajo and Hopi uh, um, uh, COVID relief fund. And I, I, I think I know why, but I thought uh, it would be a good opportunity for you to explain your, your rationale. Um, Christine. Okay. Uh, so I did mention very briefly the Choctaw Nation. And in 1847, the Choctaw Nation who were in Oklahoma heard about what had happened in Ireland, probably through the agent who was there, who was had some associations with Quakers. And if you know in Choctaw history, they were one of the so-called five civilized tribes. And as a result of Andrew Jackson's policies in the 1830s, they'd been taken from their rich homelands in the Mississippi, forced to travel thousands of miles. Many of their people had died. And then they were in this alien, unfriendly, um, territory that was Oklahoma, then called Indian Territory. But these people heard about what was happening in Ireland and they raised two donations. The main one was $174. Uh, that was from the Choctaws and the Cherokees heard about it and the Cherokees also got together and they raised a number of donations. Some went to Scotland but they also went to Ireland. Scotland was also suffering and it just seems that people who themselves have suffered so much just had that empathy that even though they had so little, they had no, nothing to gain by giving money to Ireland and they had no Irish connections yet. You know, this reaching out, this arm of humanity. And I think in Choctaw, um, Choctaw people talk about the circle of giving. And it, to me, that's a very powerful message. And when you, this current COVID epidemic, pan, sorry, pandemic occurred, I've been working with a Choctaw historian and I wanted to do something because again, I'm very conscious of what Mary Robinson called you. As Irish people, we have this informed consciousness of what it means to suffer, what it means to be hungry. So I reached out to my friend, my Choctaw friend, and I said, is there a way I can just make a donation to help? Because I know you Native Americans, um, African Americans are suffering particularly during this crisis. And she just came back to me and said, you know, the Choctaw people were pretty organized at the moment, but the Navajo and Hopi people are really struggling. You give money to them. And to me, again, that was part of this you know, spirit of generosity and compassion. And so that became one of my charities, you know, whatever. And so when you asked us, Catherine and I, we said, we don't want money for ourselves. And we just said, you know, we really would love if you could you know, give to the Navajo and the Hopi people. So thank you for agreeing so readily. Absolutely. So $50,000. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um, we'll be coming from the Irish Rambles and, and the NHA. Lucy's to my, my left. And uh, uh, I, I want to thank Lucy and uh, uh, the Bridge of Culture Irish Rambles for uh, partnering, uh, allowing us, uh, allowing the NHA to partner tonight. Okay, let's uh, get into some more questions here. Um, so here's one on science, uh, which is an interesting place to start, and then we'll go to religion, and uh, we've got a number of other uh, topics to cover. And uh, this question is, can you discuss the reasons for the uh, potato crop failure? Was there a bacteria in the soil? And uh, there's a second part to this question, but we'll start there. Um. Do you want to go, Catherine, or should I say something and then you can add to it? Uh, you know, you go, you go with that and, and uh, I'll, I'll chime in afterwards. Okay, okay. so as a non-scientist, this is probably, if the 
person asking as a scientist, I apologise. Um, but what I can say is that in, during the Great Hunger, nobody knew what the antidote was. They knew there was this disease, it was an unknown disease, and there were all sorts of weird ideas about how it could be stopped, and none of them worked. And it was only, I think, five, six years ago that, again, my language might be incorrect, but a pathogen was found. But what we do know that this was a virus and it was caught, um, transmitted by spores and in the climate and conditions of Ireland, especially the wind, it really spread very, very quickly and um, it survived. There wasn't a lot of, uh, it just survived in Ireland. So I can't really say too much because I am not a scientist. I don't want to get it wrong. But what I do know is that an antidote was discovered in the 1880s and the antidote yeah, yeah. to this particular form of light is copper sulfate, the bright blue chemical. Yeah, yeah. And to this day, um, copper sulfate is used because, because it's a virus, it's still there. It just may diminish, but it doesn't disappear. So copper sulfate is still used as an antidote. So that would yeah, really yeah. be my yeah, knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it, it, the famine, uh, many famines that were in the 90s during the administrations of Arthur Balfour and then his brother Gerald, that they did use that uh, uh, technique to try to reduce uh, the, the loss of the potato. But obviously it wasn't uh, a, a totally effective uh, means. And what, while you're talking also about recurring famines, uh, Christine, even beyond 1925, there was significant difficulty in Ireland in the West in, in uh, 1954. Uh, crop, crop, crop failures and uh, uh, food shortages that the Irish government was very, very, now a free government, of course, independent government was very, very reluctant to uh, have publicized. And uh, when foreign inquiries came about this, uh, they denied that this was happening because this was seen as a kind of shame on uh, the independent nation. Yeah, and the same in 1925. We, I just tried to go not too far forward. But I know emigration in the 1950s was almost as high as during the That's 1840s. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, 1950s emigration from Ireland was incredible. And again, that's sort of a forgotten period. And a lot of it, I think, was channeled towards Britain because America had closed off um, the, you know, the ways of getting in to some extent. So yeah, poverty. And I, I mean, it's not the same, but I was in Dublin in the 1980s and it wasn't, you know, we weren't starving. But again, massive recession and massive emigration in the 1980s. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, it seems to be, and James, I'm sure you remember, you know, generations... Well, no. Uh, yeah, I'm a product of that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, just so uh, I, I understand, just to pursue this on um, science, uh, so those spores, uh, uh, those spores went across England, uh, Wales, oh, and, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Normandy as well, but they had other crops, so they weren't. That's right, yeah. Uh, uh, so on. And it's thought the disease came from, uh, potatoes came from South America and it's thought the disease did and it was spotted 1844 in North America and then it seemed to work its way to Europe, from Europe came to the Isle of Wight up into England and it came to Ireland probably the last place in Europe in 1845 and to some extent that protected Ireland from it. And one school of thought is um, because of the development in steam shipping, it um, came on guano, you know, dung that was imported from South America. And in the old days of sail, sail shipping, it might not have survived, but because there was now faster transport methods, it did survive. So there's sort of theories out there about you know, why it came and whatever. But yeah, what we do know is sadly there was no antidote to it. People just didn't know what it was. Uh, certainly some of the whalers would have been no strangers to guano, uh, which were harvested in Pacific and broad east for fertilizer. Uh, the, the next piece of the uh, uh, question is rather interesting, uh, and it's got to do with the intersection of science and uh, 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 economics. How are the monies uh, used in Ireland? Uh, was it uh, uh, largely used for getting food and, and health oriented aid, or uh, was there any use of the money to try to improve crops for future, future years? So, uh, was there any investment and uh, uh, education surrounding the, the investment? So I'll, will I start, Catherine, and then you take it over? 
uh, I, we're very poor. Sorry, I, I couldn't quite hear your question, James. Yeah, uh, uh, so uh, uh, Catherine, the question has to do with uh, the humanitarian aid, whether it was a, a direct uh, humanitarian aid uh, of food and, and aid, or uh, was there any attempt to um, address the underlying economic uh, issues? Uh, in, in, in which period? Uh, I must, it doesn't, it's not stated here. Why, why don't we just go back to Well, the, uh, well certainly uh, it, 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 in the period after the, uh, on Gautamoa, the Great Famine, within some areas of Ireland, particularly in Munster and in Len Leinster, uh, there was an effort to uh, modernize and try to rationalize uh, the agricultural activity and uh, have a more diverse uh, uh, production of crops. And so you began to see uh, more uh, 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 other, you know, grains being grown. And in addition to that, there was also a move to convert a lot of land that had been under tillage to cattle, which uh, uh, was uh, really not very helpful to the cottier class because it put them out of jobs as, as laborers. But from an economic point of view, the agricultural production. Now, one of the problems in the West of Ireland that uh, caused, that helped to cause the 1879 crisis was that that kind of change was not possible in the West of Ireland because of the poor quality of the soil, particularly mm -hmm. in areas like Galway and Mayo. And in addition to that, the people there, they, they continue the old con acre method of agriculture. But more than that, they did not change their marriage uh, patterns. They married young and they tended to have very uh, large number of children. And in some spots in the West, the density of population in 1879, 1880 was actually higher than what was the case in, in, in the period of the great hunger. So they, they kind of skipped out on that process of modernization. Now, what happened after 1879, 1880 was really not as, as much of innovation, but it was immigration that was the safety valve. And it is at that time that immigration from the west of Ireland to the United States becomes very, very important. And indeed, my maternal grandparents, who uh, were alive during that uh, 79 to 80 uh, period of crisis as, as youngsters, they immigrated to Boston uh, in, in the uh, 1880s. So on uh, all my sides, I have uh, relatives who were impacted by these famines, which is of course one of the reasons that it sparked my interest in learning more and more about it. Both, both sides of the Shannon, as they say. That's right, um, yeah. Um, Catherine, just to pick up on that point that you just made, can you talk about the switch as a result of going from crops to cattle and what that meant for um, um, moving people off the land and the impact that it had on immigration? Yeah, well, well certainly uh, if somebody had land, it was much better for, for them to have cattle on their land than people. And of course, there, with industrialization in, in Britain, particularly in the last half of the 19th century, there was a rising demand for, uh, for beef and other meat products, uh, but particularly for beef. And so it's at, it's at that time that you get uh, you know, th this conversion uh, over to tillage farming. Now, this just doesn't uh, uh, over to grazing rather than tillage farming. And in fact, it, in the west of Ireland, especially in uh, the last two decades of the 19th century uh, and the first decade of the 20th century, it led to a great deal of competition between the small farmers, some of whom now were owners of, of soil as a result of British legislation that. Uh, provided basically mortgage money for people to buy their properties. But there was a lot of tension between them and the graziers who wanted to expand their, uh, their territory uh, and, and um, have, have more cattle. Uh, Christine, over to you, different topic on arts and culture. Uh, if I recall correctly, you talked about 
the absence of music and dance and singing, which was, it, it always struck me as very poignant. Uh, and this was a result of the drop of the population. And, well, yeah. Um, so there's a phrase, you know, music, poetry and dancing died and these things never returned as they had been. The famine killed everything, which to me is particularly poignant because we talk often at the famine in terms of loss of population and in terms of you know, statistics and a million people died and two million people emigrated and we forget you know, the human stories behind those statistics. But the other thing we sometimes forget is the whole way of life was destroyed because you know, a quarter of the population was removed from Ireland. And then, unlike earlier famines, Ireland never recovered. The population kept falling. And as we know, the population today is smaller now than it was in 1845. So that, again, makes the Irish famine unique, that Ireland has never recovered from this disaster of 175 years ago. But one of um, the sadnesses was that many of the people who died were Irish language speakers. Right. Yeah. So it really had an impact on the Irish language. And then because of the need to emigrate afterwards, people were going to English speaking countries. So you know, Irish, again, suffered as a result of that you know, practical need of speaking. Um, you know, people in the wake of the famine, because they feel they'd offended God, both Protestants and Catholics tended to be much more um, devotional in terms of their religious practices. And so, you know, Irish dancing, that whole stiff thing we think about as being post-famine, sort of that sums up that idea of, you know, this joyless society that people seem to live in and just trying to survive. And then some new research, going back to the science, um, which is really exciting, is the study of epigenetics which mm -hmm. really is the last 10, 15 years. And again, if there's a scientist in the audience, I apologize, I'm not. Um, but we know more about DNA now. And what it seems to suggest is that if people have undergone sustained trauma or malnutrition, famine, that it remains, it becomes transgenerational and it remains within you for five generations. And one of the manifestations of that is depression, suicide, even obesity. But you James, I don't know your age, but Catherine and I, we are probably you know, that fifth generation. I always say we are children of the famine in that you know, that is still really in our DNA. So you know, the impact of the famine, it didn't stop in 1852. It really continued to have you know, a great impact on um, people in Ireland and people in the rest of the world, you know, wherever the Irish diaspora reached. Um, you touched on religion um, with the Quakers in your, your talk. Um, can you talk about the role, and you obviously talked about the, uh, the role of the uh, Catholic Church. What about the role of the uh, Anglican Church? I can talk about that briefly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. And even the role of the Catholic Church during the famine hasn't been so examined. There's one great book by Donald Kerr, but that's almost 30 years old now. So again, the churches really haven't been examined in the detail I think they should be. Um, again, it was varied. In some ways, the Anglican Church gets, you know, tainted with proselytism, what we know in Ireland is superism, that idea of converting people. But that was a very small part of the Anglican church mission. That was evangelicals. Um, and there was superism in Ireland. You know, we'll give you soup if you take the Bible at the same time and you convert to Protestantism. That was a very small part of charity, but it's left a long dark shadow. But what we know is that maybe as many as 20 Anglican ministers died because they were, you know, again, we use this phrase now, frontline workers, but they were tending to their flocks. And we know in Belfast, I gave the brief quote from Belfast, but as I said, you know, the Shankill graveyard, which is Protestant, was overflowing at the time of the famine. Protestants died. And just as Catholic priests came to the help of their flocks, Anglican ministers came to the help of their flocks. So it's a really complex story. And just back to Belfast, the area that's, if again, anyone knows Belfast, the area that suffered most during um, 1847 was the Newtonards area, which is to this day is hardline, hardline Protestant. Hardline. Yeah. yeah, hardline. And you, in 1847, was overwhelmed, Bally McCarrish was overwhelmingly Protestant. So certainly Protestants died during the famine. And that's something that, you know, 20, 30 years ago would have been rejected, but you know, we know that to be the case. So yeah. all the time, what's, I think for Catherine and I, what's exciting is the last 25 years, there's been such an interest and outpouring and of 
books, publications, research. And so we're getting to know more and more all the time. And all the time it's getting more complicated, but it's right. good. But there right. are some areas like the Anglican Church we need to know more about. Yeah. And, oh, and within Northern Ireland, uh, there, there was a, a kind of political rationale for people to deny that the yeah. famine had uh, an impact upon the North, because of course they wanted to suggest that this area that was so loyal to the Union, particularly from the 1870s on, mm -hmm. uh, that because they were hard work, supposedly hard working, upright Protestants, then. Uh, God's vengeance would not c come down on them. And of course, they uh, were the area of Ireland, which, which began industrialization in the, the latter half of the 19th century. So it, it was part of their identity complex to deny that this could have happened to the Protestants who uh, allegedly lived more upright, productive lives than uh, the, the feckless, lazy, drinking Catholics. So, uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm conscious of the time here, and, and, and we're, we've gone well past an hour. I, I, I must ask this question because it's uh, coming up as an alert on my, my, my um, uh, screen here. Uh, it says, my Irish ancestor was arrested for breaking the ground. Does this mean stealing root crops? I, I haven't heard of that before. Have you heard of this? I don't know. Oh, about that, no. I, I stumped the scholars. I yeah. love it. I yeah. this is... <laughs> well, I mean, certainly, if you go back to looking at some of the illustrations from the from the Illustrated London News, you do see that famous one of the children, you know, scrubbing the field to see if they can find mm -hmm. something. And you know, I'm sure if one looked through the uh, crime report sections of uh, the Irish newspapers. Even, even, you know, late in the time, you might have found instances of people going into uh, other people's fields uh, at, at night looking uh, to find some food if their families were desperate. Well, so I'm sure that that's probably where uh, it came from. Well, certainly, as we were waiting to start, the background music was the Fields of Athen Rye, and it talks about stealing Trevelyan's corn. Uh, yeah, 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 right, Trevelyan. right. Yeah. Um, Okay, I think we, we, we must continue this uh, on behalf of Lucy and myself. Uh, it's just absolutely terrific. I, I, I want to call out uh, Novation Media for their sponsorship of this. Uh, Alan Mary do, uh, Novissimo do such an absolutely wonderful job. And uh, uh, we want to thank all our viewers. We want to thank our members for bringing programs like this uh, uh, well to the world. And uh, we encourage everybody to dial back in on March 16th uh, when... Uh, 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 Mike Harrison, our, our Obed Mason research chair, and he'll be speaking about Captain Joseph Plaskett and the links between Nantucket and Chile. And so that's going to be a great mm. uh, presentation. Um, Catherine and Christine, just terrific to see you again. Uh, you are coming to Nantucket this summer. Get your shots, get over here, and uh, we will mm -hmm. we'll do. To love, love to. <laughs> we'll do. And, we'll, and, have a bag, we'll have a bag of Tato and some Cadbury's here for you. <laughs> Yeah, and, and can, I, can I say that I'm really thrilled to participate in something that's done in the memory of Henry Varian, because he was a great friend of mine uh, back in the days when he ran the village coach house in, in Brookline. So I, I, I'm really happy to be involved in this. Big smile on Lucy's face here. I can't see it behind the mask, but I know there's a smile there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. We'll close this out and... Uh, we'll see you both soon. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, James. Good night, Catherine. Bye.